question, but I just thought I'd read one little thing from this memoir. Can you guys see it? Is it backwards or forwards for you? It's You Could Make This Place Beautiful by Maggie Smith. It's a new memoir and it's very unusual. Um, but I just, one little thing, she's very, it's very meta. It's very breaks the fourth wall kind of thing. And to the point that she talks about writing things like a note on plot is the name of the thing that I'm going to read you quickly. It's a mistake to think of my life as plot, but this isn't this what I'm tasked with now, making sense of what happened by telling it as a story, or rather making sense of what is happening. When you lose someone you love, you start to look for new ways to understand the world. It's a mistake to visualize the narrative arc I was handed in school, inciting incident, rising action, crisis, climax, falling action, resolution, denouement, and to try to map my life onto it. It's a mistake to lay that shape over my lived experience, like a transparency the teacher would align over a worksheet projected so we could watch her write on it. It is a mistake to ask oneself, is this falling action? Is this crisis? Plot is what happened, and what happened is one thing. What the book, the life, is about is another thing entirely. So, any, um, sorry, I was distracted by a meeting chat thing there. Right, anyway. Um, so, any thoughts about that from my esteemed colleagues or anybody on the call? Hmm. Well, first, do we want to welcome everyone and, and introduce ourselves? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I'm, so, I'm so used to us being <laughs> We're kind so of like used a to... group that we know. Yeah, that's right, right. Oh, Barbara, yeah, do you idea. want it? Yeah, want to do that? I can, I can begin, yes. Okay. Um, my name is Barbara Boyd, and I'm one of the three coaches that is hosting this webinar, the chat, chat, what were we calling it? Web, Web chat, chat. Mm -hmm. um, today, and I'm also hosting Mainly Memoir, our writing retreat that happens in Biddeford, Maine in September. And I am a book coach certified by Author Accelerator, and I work in nonfiction and memoir. Um, so many of the memoirs I do are in the sort of memoir plus or hybrid memoir category where it, there's a person's story, but there's also some sort of lesson for the reader as well. Next up. Okay, I will go. I will go. Um, I'm Suzette Mullen. I'm um, also an author accelerator certified coach in fiction and nonfiction. And I coach um, primarily memoir. Um, I um, have a special interest in working with LGBTQ plus writers. And I'm also a memoir writer myself. I have um, a memoir coming out in February 2024 called The Only Way Through is Out by the University of Wisconsin Press. And I'm excited to talk about structure, which in my experience as a memoir writer and coach is at least the, it's one of the top two challenges for memoir writers. Oh, I guess that leaves me. <laughs> I'm Suzanne Dunlap. I am, I am actually a historical novelist. That's what I write but I am also a storyteller and I work with memoir writers as an author accelerator certified book coach. And uh, to me, I, it's, there's so many of the things in fiction that apply to memoir, even more so with historical fiction where you're writing about real people and real places and you have to take events that don't arrange themselves into a perfect arc and make them, make them work just as you do in memoir. So, um, and I'm living, I live in Biddeford, Maine, which is where the uh, retreat will be next Are September. You okay? Are Hello? You okay? Huh? You okay, there we go. Sorry. All right. Um, should we, we don't have a lot of people. Maybe we want to go around and just say, have everybody just quickly introduce themselves. Is that something people would like? And talk about what you're, what, where you are with your memoir, what 
is whether structure is something that you're struggling with or anything like that. Uh, you know, I'm just going to call on people because <laughs> that's the easy way to do it. And starting from the sort of top of my screen, uh, Autumn, you want to say something about who you are, where you are, what your memoir is currently? Sure. Um, I'm here from um, Ohio and um, I haven't, uh, don't have a memoir per se, but I just write a lot of little essays, uh, mostly, well, at this point in my life about my mother um, who was recently diagnosed with dementia and just kind of dealing with that mostly as a cathartic way of dealing with it. And uh, maybe one day it'll turn into something, but I've just always written uh, creative nonfiction. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Oh, and anybody who doesn't want to be uh, kind of put on put in the spotlight for any reason, feel free to share in the chat what it is uh, that you're doing with your memoir. Um, I'm trying to, I'm going to sort of pick on someone I know is new. I think uh, Rosanna. Uh, hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm uh, in Malibu, California, um, and I am writing uh, a memoir plus. Uh, it is about um, my my brother who died in a plane crash, and so I in search of answers of how he died, um, I discover um, flaws, if you will, or safety concerns in the overarching airline industry. Um, and so I explore that. Um, I did, I am struggling with structure. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm working with Jenny Nash. She's helping me get um, some boundaries. Um, and that, so that has been probably the, the biggest challenge. Um, and so my hope is that I can um, get a proposal um, you know, completed within the next few months and uh, search for an agent that can possibly get it out into the world. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl, Cheryl is saying that she wrote a memoir but fictionalized it. Ah, because I'm too afraid to put my story out there. Uh, we had a we had a, another conversation about this early on and I think it was our first, was it our second, the dangers of writing memoir and how that's often the case. Um, and Jane is saying, if I wanted to work with one of your coaches, how do I go about that? Ah, Jane, what would be really amazing, we have this retreat, which is a terrific way to start. If you've got a project that you want to really get a jump on, um, our Mainly Memoir retreat in September is you would get to work with one of, the, one of us closely, and then the other two also would be able to sort of pitch in and work with you. Um, and, you know, if you want to, we'll put, I'll put up some information about that at the end and, you know, and, uh, maybe Suzette, Barbara, whatever, we can put our email addresses in the chat. So you can also reach out to us individually. Okay. Thanks for asking that. Okay. Um, so interest in writing personal essays and maybe publish a memoir later. Okay. Uh, how about... Let me see, I'm not going to call on someone. Let me think here. How about Emily? Are you there? Oh, actually, you're not on screen, so maybe I won't call on you just in case you're in, in, involved in something else. Um, Cheryl. Cheryl mentioned oh, oh, that she had, had just came from the dentist. Yes, she wrote in the oh, chat. So. Oh, my God. Okay, so don't say anything. So All right. We, so, we haven't heard from Linda. Um, uh, I'm happy to share. I can share while I'm off screen. I'm writing okay. a, I'm writing a memoir. I just heard the new name for a coming of middle age memoir <laughs> about learning to love. <laughs> and I'm on my sixth draft. It's been to a developmental editor who didn't like the way I had structured it as pieces of a puzzle kind of put together out of order. And she advised me to use this lowercase e structure, which starts with a prologue and goes back in time and then tells the story chronologically. Um, so I'm 
about 100 pages to go on the sixth draft and then need to get it into the hands of another editor, I guess, to tell me about the balance I have between scene and summary and reflection. Because with all the beta readers I've had, they all have advised me to take out the reflection, but all the memoirs I read and love have a lot, have reflection. So anyway, that's where I am now, honing the scenes and then going to try to put it back together again in the seventh draft. So thank you, I really appreciate these webinars. Oh, good. I was just thinking Suzette, who's been through this whole process recently might have something to say to you about that. Yeah, so um, I'm curious. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to name names who your um, your developmental editors are, but I'm just wondering if Allison Williams might be might might be have been involved because she's a big fan of the um, little e structure, the the letter e structure. Um, yeah, it it's you know finding that balance between um, reflection and staying in scene is an art, and I think it also um, really depends on the type of memoir that you're writing. Um, some subjects are going to lend themselves to more reflection and some are going to be um, lend themselves to, um, yeah, we, okay, Jane, I see your comment. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, some will lend themselves to more of staying in the moment in the scene. Um, a, a really, uh, my memoir um, that is, um, now out of my hands, um, literally, um, it's with it's with the publisher um, about to be turned into um, a galley proof um, when and it's being published by University Press, an additional layer of review in a university press is you have peer reviewers and they're kind of like beta readers, but they're special kind of beta readers. And one of the comments I had from my peer reviewers was they wanted more reflection in my memoir. And so I did go back and tried to, with a light hand, layer in a bit more reflection. I didn't want to be too heavy handed um, about it, um, but it's, I don't think there's really a right or wrong answer there. Reflection does tend to take the reader out of the story um, at times. And it's also, I think it is important to make meaning out of, out of the story. Um, little E structure, let me answer that for Jane. Uh, or the letter E structure. Um, if you can picture a letter E, a, a little E, um, the the structure you would start at the, um, I don't know what you'd call it, like the bridge of the E. I wish I, I know we can probably do whiteboards, but that's outside my, that's outside my techno, technological, maybe Suzanne can can do it. Uh, outside of my technical abilities. Um, oh, Barbara. Okay, somebody want to draw a letter E? A little E? Oh, I'm not seeing anything, anything happening here. Um, so just imagine the um, a lowercase E. And what you would typically do in a lowercase E structure, um, the... Uh, the book that I hate to use wild as an example, just because it's so overused, but it is a great example. So I'm going to just use it. And many of us are familiar with it. Right. So wild starts um, in the middle of the uh, really in the middle of her hike in the Pacific crest trail, she's throwing off the um, boot and uh, one of her boots, she or she loses one of her boots. That's how the book opens. And of course, we're, as the reader, we're horrified. We think, oh, this is terrible. We don't really know what it means. And then she goes a little further and then she goes back to the quote unquote beginning. So you go back to the beginning, which you get to determine what's the beginning that you're going back to. It doesn't mean you're, not, you're going back to the day you were born, but you go back to the beginning of the story and then you catch up to where you were um, in that uh, in that original scene, and then you continue and you follow the story. Um, 
I think it's a really effective way to tell a story. It, it, it you, you, it, it still is largely a chronological s- structure, but you, since you sort of start in the middle, you, um, you can jump into the action really quickly. You can jump into a dramatic moment and then you sort of circle back to let us know how you got there. And then you continue on to the rest of the story. Is that Jane? Is that is that clear for everyone? Yeah, and um, I, I I've seen that a lot in in a lot of books now. Um, also, seeing I don't know if there's a name for this structure, but it's sort of a variation on this, which is when the the, the writer the author starts the book almost at the very end of the book. Mm-hmm. And then goes back to the beginning and kind of, kind of, you know, finishes off the ending. Um, And then we understand what that beginning scene really was about, which we don't really um, otherwise. So what do you think, I mean, how effective do you think that, what do you think that helps do for a memoir rather than just starting it from the beginning and going? through chronologically? I think it kind of, it gives you a sense of what's at stake Mm -hmm. and, and kind of grabs you in in both of them in different ways. And I've, I've worked with authors who have done both the little E and whatever we want to call that other one, (laughs) almost the end, you know, where you see that the first part of the closing scene and you are left hanging. And so you want to know what happens. And the only way to find out is to read to the end. Um, And I, I mean, I've seen that work even when the story is well known Mm. Um, and I worked with a gentleman who's, uh, uh, he was a very young entrepreneur who made hundreds of billions of dollars in a sale and within his circle, his story was, was known. And yet, you know, he started his book almost at the end where he was like right there getting ready to sign all the papers. And then it looked like the deal was going to fall through. And so you were left like, well, wait a minute, does it go or not? Even though you know that the deal went through, (laughs) but probably not many people knew that it had almost fallen through. And so that's the whole thing of like, how did you save this deal? And, um, you know, it, 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 it sets the stakes and builds suspense. You know, it's, it's good storytelling. Think about movies that, that have that opening scene. And then it's like three years earlier, and then mm-hmm. they go back and then you catch up to that. So it's not just in memoir that we see this kind of structure. And um, Barbara has been coaching Jenny Nash, of all people, on her book <laughs> to come soon yes. about the blueprint for memoir. Is that the, the actual t- title, Barbara? Is yes. there a different title? Yeah, okay. No, um, blueprint for so- memoir. Um the tagline is something like how to write a memoir for the marketplace. So this, like Jenny's other blueprint books, it offers a blueprint for, you know, writing a book, figuring out the, what your book is about, why you're writing it, who you're writing it for, and offers um, guidelines for creating the structure of the book and beginning to write. The difference here, there are many, many books about craft for memoir. Um, there's, As far as we could tell, there's not really something that talks about how do you bring that memoir to the market? How do you get it published? So um, part of that is creating a great structure and a compelling story and figuring mm-hmm. out what to tell, what to leave out. And mm-hmm. um, the structure part of of writing this, working on the coaching Jenny through the writing of this book was probably the most challenging for her. Um, and 
at the end of the day, it's really, there are two structures. It's either chronological and chronological encompassing this little E or the, the, the suspenseful, whatever you want to call that. Maybe it's a U, I don't know. Um, or it's fractured. And from there, you know, it, it can go, there are lots of nuances within each of those, but those are sort of the two main differences um, with, with memoir structure. We do need to coin a name for that, Suzette. I don't know yeah. what it is, but. That could make us famous. We could be famous could. <laughs> by doing that. We need to do that. I love it. I've heard it called a yeah. frame narrative. A witch? Sorry? Framed. A yeah. frame narrative. Oh. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Oh, somebody else has has come up with that name. That's oh, that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. yeah, and the other, I mean, the other, as Barbara mentioned, the other sort of big category, a structural category, would be more of a memoir that is either in vignettes or in essays. It's kind of a memoir in pieces, and mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the books that um, comes to my mind, in addition to the one Suzanne just read from, is um, it's another Maggie whose last name is, um, it's not the same Maggie, it's a different no. Maggie. No. Um, oh, 17, 17 um, Brushes <laughs> with Death. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, uh, Maggie, I am, I am. I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I am, I am. That's right. That's that's yeah, the subtitle. Yeah. I am, mm -hmm. I am, I am. Um, 17 Brushes with Death. So, that is a memoir where there are, are literally 17 essays, um, quote, you know, slash chapters that are, are um, self-contained essays about different moments where she had a brush with death. And she tells, so we, we learn about her life. We, we learn the story of her life through that lens and the, and the essays are not in chronological order. Um, and it completely works. Um, so that that's a, a a very different way of 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 structuring a memoir. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of variations on yeah. in uh, in that. But I kind of call that memoir in pieces. Yeah. And and actually, here's the you make a really good point because we're talking about Maggie Smith and Maggie O'Farrell, who are incredibly yes. accomplished literary writers. Maggie Smith's the poet and all that sort of thing. I think it's my sense that you have to have a really good reason for not using some kind of chronological structure in your memoir. And because I think it's harder to, it's harder for the reader, first of all. So you have to be incredibly skillful to make it work. Um, Barbara, do you have anything to add to that? I, so I'm working with a client on her third memoir and she, when we first started, she said, I think I want it to do a fractured structure. And it was like, you know, we talked about it and and then she, but she had no, not really a clear idea of what that might look like. And she has since begun, begun writing it. And so far it is chronological. I think it, I think it's very hard to, um, not write chronologically unless you have something a concept which is something else we can talk about that you can hang that fractured structure onto in the case of maggie o'farrell all of those brushes with death and they uh, are somehow you know each of them stand alone but they are linked together and it works to tell them out of order um it would have been a different kind of book and perhaps less inviting had she written it chronologically. If we think about the, the alternative in that case. Um, so I my experience in coaching writers has been chronological. It's hard enough even with just with the little E to figure out what is that inciting moment? Like where do you jump in and then return? Um, let alone trying to say, okay, I'm just going to like blow up my life and pick up the pieces and, <laughs> and put them in the order that they fall because it's not that at all. It's very calculated and 
you're you're absolutely right, Suzanne. It means to be someone who is a talented and experienced writer, I think, to pull it off well. Yeah. I'm wondering how many of you who are on this have have toyed with the idea of doing something different with the structure of your memoir. Anybody? Oh, so we're all chronological here? <laughs> Put it in the chat if you want to. Well, so. I'll say something. The, the sure. uh, memoir writing, I was taking a few classes with a local chap who gives memoir courses mm -hmm. to a small group, and he very much works on the episodic model, which is, from what I'm hearing, each he, he was coaching us to write essays and each of them being contained. And I, I'm uncomfortable with that. And I started writing out of it, you know, sort of at, from our last meeting. And I haven't written very much. I feel badly, but I, I do. Anyway, I had written a chunk and I kept going. And he wanted us, he, he wanted everything tied off. And that doesn't work for me. But then I'm trying to figure out what does. And so this uh, this is great because I'm hearing all these different. I never heard of e, Little E and all these other things. And I'm going to go out and get Maggie O'Farrell's book. And so I'm getting some great ideas from. Uh, I have read Wild, but it was a long time, well, yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. So did he did he give you a reason? I'm curious for for why he he thought that that would be the right because he did his own that way. I think that's. <laughs> And that's why I like I've taken his course about three or four times. He's a friend too. I know him, and um, but I'm not going to take it anymore because it's always the same. Mm -hmm. And so when I found you gals, I was overjoyed because <laughs> I needed some some different input. And also, I get inspired and want to keep going. So yeah, yeah. I think that's um, go ahead. Oh. I was just going to say, I think that's, we're trained, we're, all three of us are trained as book coaches. And part of that training is not to impose your idea or your voice over somebody, what somebody else, you, you look at it for what the actual story needs, what the writer needs, not just trying to kind of say, this is how it's done. <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, I think there's a difference in approach there. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to just respond to Jane, and then also um, I saw Autumn had something in the chat. I'd love to hear more about um, where Autumn is. But Jane, what I would also say, kind of a a bit of a variation on on what you just shared. Another structural decision, and and this I think is a decision that you make later on in when you're in revision, not necessarily in first draft, but it, this is something that'll come later on is how much connect, what I'd call connective tissue do you need between scenes, between chapters, between the different um, pieces. And, and that is really going to depend on both your style and also who, who is your reader. I mean, some readers will want to be led by the hand, don't want to have to sort of do the work. Um, and then other readers want to be ch more challenged and kind of put the, make the connections themselves. And um, yeah, and I would say, as Suzanne said, I mean, the more commercial your book is or that you'd like it to be the more you are going to be leading your reader by the hand and not having them have to do a lot of work um i mean these more experimental what we call kind of more experimental structures are definitely more literary are you know they're not you know they're not beach reads you know or not um <laughs> um and um so that's also something um, that you will you will kind of have a have a feel for. I in my own memoir, I initially had a lot of connective tissue, and then I took I stripped most of it away, and then I ended up putting some of it back in. And I think it's just kind of you just kind of feel your way through that. Um, Autumn, do you want to hop on and and talk to us a little bit about what where you are with your your structure? 
Well, I never heard of Little E, but maybe just from reading so many memoirs um, like Wild and um, there, uh, Wild Game. Is that is that the name, the title? Adrian. Peters? Yes, I've read. Yes, yes, I think yes. Hers is also that way. Um, Glass Castle, kind of. Maybe that's a little bit more towards the yeah. end. Um, maybe not really in the middle. I'm not sure, but um. So mine, the I started it kind of at the point where I realized there was something wrong with my mom. And then I kind of went back. Well, I kind of go back first to... So where I first realized something was wrong. Then I go back to like other signs that I should probably have seen. And then kind of back a little further to things that even as a little kid, I noticed that maybe is part of a bigger problem. And yeah. And then, like I said, mine is kind of in pieces at the moment because I've had to write through it um, and write what's happening now. <laughs> just to get it out. Um, so yeah, most of it's in pieces, but the starting was, yeah, kind of at that point that, yeah, I realized something was wrong and then went back. And I, I think, I think Suzette made, you made a really good point, which probably should be emphasized is that sometimes I think the decision about the exact structure comes not in the beginning, but in a revision, because I think you don't, necessarily know what you've got or how mm -hmm. it's going to be you, you know I can't tell you how many stories you don't know what the beginning should be until you get to the end so to speak yeah, sure. so yeah so I I mean I would say to you just keep plugging away and then see what you have at the end yeah. and then really think about the structure you know because yeah. you may find it works you may find you have to switch it up mm -hmm. yeah yeah but I think, too, anytime you're writing about any sort of you know, mental illness, and um, my mother also had dementia, so you have my support and sympathies. It is not an easy situation to to go through, but the layering and the noticing, I mean, there's there you may find that there are threads that it's a topical thread and you, you choose that topic and, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, money management and you remember things from your childhood and from your teenage years and, and bring that forward to today. And then the next piece is another thread, you know, there's, which would be sort of, a, you know, a topical, a, a conceptual, a conceptual fractured structure, sort of what we've been talking about. Um, but I think both Suzanne and Suzette make a great point about it's often in the writing that we figure out what that structure is going to be. Which doesn't mean you shouldn't plan ahead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <hasten> to add. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, it's, it's, we're all big, we're all big proponents of planning and and recognizing that planning helps you you know kind of put the bumper rails up it gives you it gives you a focus so you're not you know particularly when you're writing memoir so you're not just like the whole you know my whole life and just writing random stuff about different things and you're like you have an idea of you know, what you think the story's about, you know, I, I like to say to my clients in the beginning, what we're looking for, you know, using, even though I've never really um, done archery, but, you know, I liked using it as a metaphor, like we're, we're aiming to have that target, right. And to know what the target is. And the more we write, the more we write, we get closer to the bullseye. So in the beginning, we're not, you know, we're not trying to hit the bullseye. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to identify the target. And, um, and so the planning is, we feel is very, very important. And what planning does is it gives you the structure that then you have the freedom to within that structure to 
find the story, what the story, the deeper story is, and then ultimately how you're going to tell the story. And, um, and like Suzanne said, the, and I think we've talked about this in one of our earlier um, webinars is that, you know, where the story, what is on page one often is not clear until you're practically at the end. I mean, you know, not just the end of the first draft, but you're practically at my, in my manuscript that is, you know, now with the publisher, my opening pages, the first few pages are different from the pages that I pitched the book with that they accepted the book with. Um, and it just, you know, it, so I'll, if you're struggling with your opening, I just want you to know you're exactly where you need to be. And it will, <laughs> it will be clear at some point and, um, um, and not to, not to get too concerned if it's not clear now. Yeah. Wise words. So, also, the other thing about structure, and Barbara, you're going to say something, and I'll just quickly say this is that it, I, I, there's, I think in many ways, the content drives the structure. You know, I mean, I think that that's, it really depends. As, as Barbara gave the example of the clues of the, um, of dementia, you know, that's a way of kind of finding the structure by looking at what you're actually writing. And Barbara could probably explain that better. <laughs> um, so that's the, you know, the idea of concept, like what there, I think, because of it's either it's become more prevalent or we talk about it more, there have been many memoirs written about parents with dementia or with Alzheimer's recently. And so using that as an example, it, it, if you're thinking about pitching that to an agent or even directly to an independent publisher, you know, their thinking might be, oh, great, another book about dementia. But if you have something, th that concept of this, actually there were signs, you know, or... It, it, whatever that conjecture might be, you then have a concept to wrap that around, that it is no longer just a book about dementia. It's about how you lived it and why your experience with it is different than, different from the other books that are out there. Um, and I just had another example and it escapes me right now. Sorry. Um, you're muted, Suzanne. But of course, having said that, which is absolutely right, people who are looking for, who are living through that, are going to be reading all sorts of different books on the topic. So, you know, there's there's plenty of room for, for those sorts of things. That don't make the mistake that, oh, it's been written about, I can't do this, you know. But that wasn't what Barbara was saying, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, another way I think of of defining what we mean when we say a concept is what is the particular angle that you are you want to enter this story and through? And um, you know, um, I, as a, as we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, I work with a lot of LGBTQ plus writers, and if all their story is about coming out, you know, if it's just a coming out story that, that, you know, it's a very important story to them and it may be important to other people and it's unlikely it's going to get, you know, picked up by a publisher, um, um, a, a traditional publisher, an agent, because there needs to be something, there needs to be a distinctive angle that, that, type of story is being entered into that hasn't been entered into before. One example that comes to my mind is one of my new favorite memoirs. It's called The Family Outing. It's by Jesse Hempel. And it is, so Jesse is a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And her story is about how 
every member of her family over a, I believe it was a five year period came out in one way or the other. The majority of them came out as somewhere on the LGBTQ plus spectrum, although not everyone, but her, her concept is that everyone has a closet and, um, and, uh, you know, and we all hide in our closet for various reasons. And we all, or many of us reach a point where hiding in that closet is no longer tenable. And so that was the angle through which she told her story. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, you know, talk about structure. It's a really interesting book, the way it's structured, because she's telling a family story. She's telling her own story. And then she's also kind of telling the story, the individual family member stories, because um, with their permission. Um, but that's kind of, I think, what, what, we're getting at when we talk about uh, you know if if the idea of concept doesn't you can't hang something onto that maybe think about it as what's the particular angle through which you're you're going to talk about grief um or you know that's another category grief how many grief memoirs are out there i mean you know and um Yeah. Suzette, you muted yourself. Oh. I did because I I wanted other people to get to talk, but I'm saying um <laughs> uh yeah. But I can keep talking. I'm happy. No, no. I like to talk. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um yes. And as they say in improv. <laughs> um, oh, no, I forgot what I was going to say. I had something going right there, right there. But um, again, I think that that you can think, look for those things and use a concept as an organi organizing principle, not a structure, if that makes sense. There's a difference. Exactly, exactly. Well said. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, back to the, your comment earlier, Suzanne, that in many ways the content can drive the structure, um, you know, and you brought up the example of the I, I am, I am, I am the, um, or, you know, we talked about that, um, the 17 brushes of, with death. When you think about what a book that, describe those 17 brushes of death could have been like if the author had told that chronologically in a traditional narrative. I mean, I don't think I would have gotten past chapter four, right? I mean, who, you know, who wants to read? And, and this is another thing that happens when you are writing about a subject matter, I think where there's a lot of trauma involved is that, you know, if you are if you are literally writing a chronology or the, a, of, of trauma after trauma after trauma, you're, it's going to be really hard for you to pull off a book that your readers are going to want to keep, keep reading because it's just, it's, it just gets to be too much. And so your job is to create a narrative, a, a, a you know, an arc that has, there's, there's, that's not just a an episodic retelling of all the trauma that you've been through. And so 17 brush, I am, I am, I am, 17 brushes of death works because, well, she's a fantastic writer, but it also works because of the structure she chose, um, which makes it a much more interesting book. And, and um, Lisa was asking for a little more clarification of the difference between structure and organizing principle. And I have one little example of a memoir, a lovely fun memoir by Wendy Ahrens called We're, I'm Wearing Tunics Now. And it's a chronological memoir. It's hilariously funny. It just, if you're, if you're a woman of a certain age, it's really lovely and reassuring to read. 
but her organizing principle is the kinds of clothes and the, and the clothing decisions she's made. Chapter one, I'm wearing chunky heels now. Chapter two, I'm wearing maternity pants now. Then I'm wearing twin set sweater. So, so that's the organizing principle, but it's, but it's not a structure. Does that make it clear? Yeah. Um, thank you for that. That's, I don't know if I'm like being too nitpicky, but so how is the organizing principle, e even in that case, different from the structure? Well, the structure is chronological. Oh, you okay? said that. Okay, yeah. got it. So yes. It, yeah, right. Yeah. So it looks pregnancy and it was this year to that year and da 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 da. Yeah. But it was around it's, the. It's, it's, it's um, an organizing principle. It's through its content. It's, it's how, you, how you package the content that you're writing about. Yeah. And Emily brings up a good question in the chat. Does the organizing principle determine the content shared? And in this mm -hmm. case, it does because, and, and I have not read the book, I've read about the book. Mm -hmm. um, but my sense is that, you know, as Suzanne said, it, it's about this, you know, woman of a certain age and the choices that she's making. She could have told that through signs of menopause. Instead, she chose it. She told it through the clothing choices that she's making. And so there, that organizing principle will determine the stories that make the cut and those that don't. Yes. But, and also they go, that's, it is just an organizing principle in that there's more content in the book than just of that. So, yeah. I, I like to think of it sort of as a, almost like as a device, um, you know, um, the organizing principle, it's a, it's a, it's a device to, to tell through which you're going to tell your story. So yeah, like, I, like I haven't read the book that Suzanne just mentioned, but I, you know, I'm making an assumption that she's using the device of clothing as a way to enter into talking about what is what it's like to be a woman at midlife and um and and or a woman at different stages of life um and that's her story but she's choosing to use clothing as that organizing principle or or the device you know it's not it's not that's not what the story is about but it's just the it's the device through which she's telling the yeah. story I do just have to say my favorite chapter title of all is Lisa's I'm wearing bad decisions from the juniors department now. <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. I have a quick follow up. So then would you say that particularly in this case that in a sense the organizing principle is the sort of high concept? It can be. Yes, it can be. It really. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it can be. But I would take it's something like Maggie. O'Farrell's memoir is more high concept than this. And it's hard to explain why, except that there's something very intrinsically dramatic about her brushes with death as opposed to the clothes she's wearing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. Have we forgotten any kind of structure? I mean, I think uh, does anybody have questions about? You know, I, I what, have a question. Yeah. It just occurred to me. I was thinking as you were talking, heavy versus light, mm -hmm. in terms of the subject matter and uh, the the. Uh, I'm wearing tunics now. I haven't read it, but I'm making this list of books, and I'm hoping I can get them in Canada. <laughs> um, not sure, but I will order them. I guess I guess I can get them on a Amazon or something yeah. like that. Um, I so I'm wearing tunics now. Look, sounds like it might be light. Or it's very humor. funny. Yeah. Yes, it's hilarious. And <laughs> and the seventeen brushes with death sounds like it's probably not terribly funny. But I haven't read that one either. And I know I know that what I'm writing, I, even though I can be very funny, I'm told what I'm writing isn't funny. And yet I feel that that's what I'm supposed to be writing right now. So I think may, does that have a bearing on how you organize what you're what you're writing? Hmm. Hmm. 
good question. I think that that harkens back to what Suzette said earlier, that if you have, if you're writing about trauma, there's a pacing to it that there need to be some moments of non-trauma because I think even, and, and that partly reflects someone's life, much like there are probably some serious moments in I'm wearing tunics now that are told with some levity, but they're, they're still serious moments, you know, it's, mm. it, and that just because every day isn't one long laugh, nor is every day a never ending trauma. There are those, those beacons of light that happen even in for someone who is going through trauma. And so you don't, you want to pace it so that you're not exhausting your reader in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, this is basically serious. It's the collapse of her marriage and everything like that. But there are some moments in it that make you smile because she's such a, she's such a good writer, just little things. And she, her, her device of using literary forms, especially if you're a writer or an avid reader yourself, can make you can sort of make you smile a bit because you understand her references. So yes, there's you know I think it's a balance. And I would just say, um, Jane, with respect to humor, um, which is you know maybe this is not so so much about structure, but um, it's, you know, it's an important topic is that if you are, if you're funny, if like you are a funny person, if you're funny, um, or, you know, that's an aspect of your personality, um, that is very appropriate for that to come through in your writing, right? In your writing voice, no matter what you're writing about. And with what Barbara said, I think it's especially important if you are writing about hard things because the reader re needs some relief. And the book that comes to my mind mm. uh, recently is um, Jeanette McCurdy's book, I'm Glad My My Mother Died or My Mom Died. And, you know, just even from that title, you can kind of, you know, get a little bit of her personality, right? That, you know, sort of, <laughs> I mean, that's quite an, you know, quite a, whether that you think that's funny or not, but it, it, she writes about some really, really hard things in this book, and there's a lot of trauma in this book, and there are very, very funny parts as well. And um, so I always say to my writers, um, don't try to write funny if you're not funny, but if you, <laughs> if you are funny, um, it can be a really, a real gift to infuse that into your, into your writing. Yeah, uh, I, I I may have given the wrong impression. I'm I'm not writing about trauma. There's lots, but I'm okay, not going to yeah. touch it. There's no way not ready. Um, I'm writing more about the early my early days. I may have explained that last time uh, in the newsroom at the Globe and Mail, right. and then and going back and forth. And I'm now thinking that actually using that as a center and going out from there is something I might like to try. Um, mm -hmm. There are there's some humor in it, but a lot of it is uh, getting, <clears throat> it's the whole arriving in one's seventies, having a terribly bruised head from the glass ceiling <laughs> and, um, and, and showing that like, you know, the, the, the kind of my naive desire to be taken seriously. Meanwhile, in the, the editors were calling me the devil with a blue dress on because I had a hot little body and I, all I cared about was doing a great job. And, and so that's, and, and that's a theme that's run through my entire life in one way or another. And I think a lot of us who are at now, you know, baby boomers have encountered that. And so that's actually, I know who I'm writing for. It's us kind of thing. <laughs> and, and <clears throat> so I, I feel that I'm trying to make what I'm writing relatable. It's not, at times it's not funny because it's sort of sad that I'm trying to portray myself as the fool because I was. And and then what the, re and then constantly smacking up against these realities. So well, does as, that as, make sense? 
Absolutely. And as we all know, those, you know, quote unquote fool, I'm sure you weren't a fool, but those kinds of characters <laughs> have a very tragic side, you know, I mean, it's, let's have Pagliacci, you know, yeah. so um, I can sort I can sort of see where that would make a lot of sense. And I, we only have a few minutes left. We have one minute left or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. If you want to make sure you're all aware of the retreat we're hosting, it's, it's a terrific chance to get to work, not with just one coach, but three. And um, it's really, a, it's a, we, we will be coaching before, during and after the retreat. So it's not like you're just kind of kind of come do something and then leave and, and you're off on your own. It, we see it as a process and um, and it's all about memoir and it's all about women. And I think you know, from what I'm hearing of you, a lot of you on this call, it could be something that you'd really enjoy doing. And I put the, uh, I put our mainlymemoir.com is the retreat website. If you want to go there and check it out a little bit. And we have an application process because we do want to make sure that everybody who's there is meshed, that, they, that it's going to be a good group. Because um, the, the dynamics of the group are a huge part of a retreat, I think. So, um, yeah, and we have, and all our, if you have any questions, you want to talk to any of us, we've, I've put our, um, I've put our email addresses there. You're more than welcome to, it's, uh, to reach out and we can answer any questions you have. Um, and Lisa, I wish you could come to the retreat too. <laughs> that would be great. And it's, of course, it's not always possible for, for people, but it, it is going to be fun. Um, do you know anyone who works with memoir in verse? I don't, mm. but Barbara might. No, because Jenny in her book mentioned one. Um, I <gasps> Oh, there's a, there's a middle grade memoir in verse that's gorgeous. Yes. What's yes. her name? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Jenny Nash. I have it. There's Jacqueline Woodson. Yes. Thank Jack you. Yeah. Jacqueline, Jacqueline Woodson. Woodson. Yes. Yeah. Love yeah. that. Yeah. Again, that's yeah. the sort of thing that you have to be really, really good at in order to carry off, to sort of carry off because it's just that unusual enough for a, um, you know, for a, a publisher or a reader to be a little bit doubtful about. And yes, it's Jenny Nash. Jenny Nash trained the three of us. So uh, mm -hmm. we're very closely, and Barbara has coached Jenny Nash on her book coming out that is Blueprint for a Memoir as well. But whether Jenny coaches memoir in verse, I mm -hmm. kind of doubt it, <laughs> but yeah. I, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, um, the, I do, I do have one coach that kind of comes to mind that might, might be a good fit. Um, Julie, Julie, Julie arts. Oh, um, so MJ, um, go to Julie arts, um, dot com. Um, I think that's her website. She's um she's a colleague and a friend of ours. She was actually my book coach, um, and she does coach memoir, um, and also a number of other genres. But I know that um it's A R T Z A R T Z yeah. Um, she does coach. Um, um, I know she's written um not a memoir in verse, but she's written a I think a Y A fantasy in verse so in other words she's comfortable with the with writing in verse and I believe she's done some coaching in that and Julie is fantastic so if yeah. um you do reach out to her please let her know that um we we um referred you to her and um she's great so th that would definitely be a a person to check out okay great well, yes. this is our last one. So thank you for those um, who have been on several of these and you're on our email list. And um, we would, um, we do still have some spaces available um, for our, our retreat at September 21st through the 24th in Biddeford, Maine. That's the in-person part. And we'll begin working with writers um, 
this summer um, to prepare for the retreat, and then there'll be follow up after the retreat. So please do reach out if you are interested. And the other thing is that Thank it you. doesn't really matter where you are in your process. You could be just thinking about it. You could be halfway through. You could have a first draft and you need, you're at the point of revision. We can work with all of that. And in fact, it's great to have people who are at different stages. So just so you know. And yeah, it's been really fun getting to know some of you. It has been. We're glad yeah. you've enjoyed them. Yeah. Maybe after the I'm summer. I'm glad it was helpful. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Yeah, Thank right, you, then. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye